So after making those last two programming series videos on volume and intensity, I realized afterwards, after kind of reflecting all that, that I kind of missed one big topic that I want to cover today, and that's understanding how to optimize a program based off of a lifter's psychology. Because not only do we need to understand the physiological um, adaptations that are occurring and what we're doing on paper to try and get stronger and produce these gains, we need to also need to understand that each lifter is an individual. And even if we write the world's most perfect program for them, based on how they execute that program, how they interpret it, how their general psychology works is going to change how that program actually is fulfilled. And I really kind of see six things as being the main factors that we look at when I'm starting to, to individualize things based on lifter psychology. And those six variables are lifter adrenaline slash intensity, lifter confidence, lifter focus, lifter stress, lifter motivation, and lifter habits. All six of those have some type of bearing on how we can adjust and manipulate the programming to fit more into their psychological response and kind of how they're gonna go through the program. So we're gonna dive into each one of these, um, some with examples, some with just more detailed explanations, but really kind of, let's get in the thick of kind of how we're gonna adjust things based off of lifter psychology. The variable that's most external and is, is able to be seen by anyone that's around a certain lifter is their, their adrenaline slash intensity. I mean, obviously, we know the people that get super amped up for a lift and we know the people that are more even keeled, whether that's in the gym or even at a meet or whatever scenario it is. People have different um, uh, uh, adrenaline levels that they usually have to go for when it comes to psyching themselves up for a lift, whether that be to a high level of intensity or just very even killed and calm and relaxed. So um, we're going to take a look at um, kind of how that plays in the programming, how we might adjust those based on individual lifters. All right. So looking at some ideas of what we could possibly do, this isn't going to be a full spectrum of this is every idea, but just kind of giving you a general example of kind of what I see. Um, Let's take this as our baseline for the day. So when we're using a lot of different examples today, use this as your baseline is that the exercise is a competition squat. We have two sets of three at 380 pounds um, and we have three sets of three at 350 pounds. And that is a 8% drop from the top set. So two top sets, three back off sets with an 8% drop. So that's just kind of the standardized model we're using. Um, the thing I typically find with lifters who go with high adrenaline and intensity is they can't maintain that. Um, it, it's not always a matter, uh, we, we, mistake, we mistake too often uh, a drop in any of these variables as fatigue and really what it is, is a drop in some type of mental psychological aspect that doesn't allow us to carry over our strength in the same manner. So what you might see is that this lifter has to get really psyched up for that top set and then to try and produce two of those is gonna be very difficult for them. Um, most likely they're not gonna be able to carry over the same focus. And what we're gonna see is a, a pretty good drop off on the second set, not because of some strength drop, but because of the adrenaline intensity drop. And so what we'll do instead is do one top set and then maybe we're gonna even need to back off more. So I use the example here of a 10% drop or even here that we might need to do a 12% drop. There might be, in whatever manner, we're learning this lifter to understand kind of what this top set takes out of them when it comes to their psychological ability to um, focus and produce the, the adrenaline intensity in a set and what they're gonna back off to. And what I kind of don't show here is, is it might even be something that we are, programming higher on some top sets, knowing that they're going to outperform their training max on the top set, but then they're gonna underperform on a back off. So it could even be something where we're gonna go higher and we know we can go 390 on a top set because they're gonna be able to reach for strength that they typically don't have, but we can't just back off the normal amount. We're gonna need to account for, okay, if they had a, um, a, a 5% jump on their top set, they're gonna have some type of bounce back down. And so we're gonna have to drop even more when it comes to their back offset. So this, is, this isn't like a, a framework of exactly what to do, but just ideas that we have to understand that um, when, when lifters typically approach sets with very high adrenaline, they're gonna have a very hard time doing that over multiple sets. Um, they usually do better with just one set. And that isn't even just a matter of um, programming this because they can only handle one set, it's programming it to go off of their strengths. So w sometimes people look at it as a weakness that they can only, that they, they get so amped up for that top set. Um, I'd rather look at that as a lifter strength because not everyone can do that. So let's allow them to drive intensity on that top set, reach for weights that they can't always hit um, in a more moderate 
uh, adrenaline state, um, and then we'll back off to whatever extent is needed for that volume work. And I, I even I get included an example here as well. Um, the 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 uh, effect of that drop off can be different too. So maybe we're maybe we're not going to drop off uh, so much that we're just going to do one top set and then four back off sets. Maybe we know that they have about a six percent drop um, in intensity once they take away that kind of high adrenaline state. So if they can hit one by three at 380, they can do a second top set per se, but not at the same adrenaline, more at a mild manner, but that's gonna take away 6% off of their normal strength level. Okay, well, we'll program that in. There's a 6% back off now from that. So that's their second top set. And then for the back off, we'll go another 6%. Um, but again, just playing into this lifter's strength, if not saying, okay, well, they need to change this. They, 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 if they, they need to stop being so amped up and, and getting into their sets. I don't like that. I, I, don't, I don't think that's always the best way to go about it. I'd rather almost them be able to say, okay, as me as a coach, I need to understand that that's one of their strengths and how they can be able to produce high intensity and really, really good sets but I need to understand how to program for them. So we're gonna, we're gonna adjust the programming to allow them to have that one heavy stimulus and then back off from there in whatever manner is needed um, for them to be able to then um, be in a more calm state and do those back offs without them being too hard. The second variable is lifter confidence. And a lot of this, this can be a newer lifter, but I've even had more experienced lifters who just suffer from a higher anxiety while lifting, especially as they're getting to heavier weights, um, or even meat anxiety, meat and anxiety. But I'm gonna cover more what we're talking about within training anxiety, which can hopefully lead to helping with meat anxiety. So um, again, taking a look at our baseline here. So two sets of three um, at 380, three sets of three at 350. So. One of the things that most lifters are anxious about is heavier weights. So something like a heavy single. So the fact of the matter is, is there's kind of two ways to approach this. Um, you can either one, force them to have to uh, uh, kind of face their fears and make them do heavy singles, or two, avoid them. Um, my personal opinion on this is they need to face their fears. Um, they need to be subjected to these heavy singles more often so that it isn't this thing that just happens uh, in a peaking block or at a meet. It's something that they feel confident that eventually they can handle these 90 to 95% weights on a weekly basis without much issue. So um, with a lot of lifters who have anxiety about heavy weights, um, we're gonna be subjecting them to that on a more frequent basis until they're over that anxiety, until it becomes this, this thing where we build confidence that it's not something that should be feared, but something that they know that they should be able to do on any given day um, just as they should. Anyone should be able to hit a seven RPE single at 89% on any day, no matter how bad that day is when it comes to their training. So we need to build that confidence to where they can do that. So that might be a lifter that I'm going to program this heavier single um, more year round because until they can get to this point where they are, are not being anxious or not being fearful of this heavy weight. And usually what we're gonna see is that's gonna lead into a meet as well because if they've hit opener weight, uh, every single week for an entire year. So 52 plus times they've hit opener weight um, come the day of the meet when they hit their opener, that's not a very big deal. They do that all the time. So um, I think one of the biggest keys for someone who is lacking confidence is we need to um, put them in those situations where they're going to have to overcome their fears and get used to it. So um, uh, another example of what we could possibly do is sometimes a lifter just, maybe they don't warm up the best or maybe they almost kind of need to build confidence leading into a set. So we might do something where we do pyramiding and building up sets. Um, I think these are often underutilized where instead of doing um, all these back offs, um, we're gonna do our top set, but we're gonna build up to our top set and then we're actually gonna do the single after that top set. I actually had one lifter um, that I coached a while back like it was, it was incredible how how big of a difference it made to put his single after a couple top sets of rep work than doing it first. Um, it was just like he he just need and he kept telling me because he's like I know it doesn't make sense. He's like I just need to feel some weight on my back and know I can do it and feel myself kind of grind a rep, not hard, but like one by three is maybe at 380, maybe it's a little bit harder. And they have to kind of, they kind of feel themselves struggle. So that almost like a fight or flight response that when they put one, the 405 on their back, one, they just did 380 by three, so they know they can do 405. But two, they've already kind of had this fight or flight response of like, okay, I'm lifting heavy weight, I need to be serious about this. And they do so. So um, while, the, 
The one issue with this is that 405 is now in sense most likely going to be harder because you're inducing than if you do it first because you're inducing fatigue beforehand. Uh, for some lifters, this may induce some form of type of confidence that because they did this prior that this is in sense going to be easy. And so it actually moves easier than if you did it first because it's this anxiety of this first heavy set and like, can I do it? Um, and then lastly, when it comes to kind of these singles, um, it kind of, it, it, I kind of see this being one of the reasons why people sometimes mistake post-activation potentiation in powerlifting as being successful. Um, and I'm not saying it's not successful. Um, one of the things is that, so post-activation potentiation, the thought process is, is that you, you do something uh, heavier or more intense um, or something that's gonna recruit high threshold motor, motor units and then you're going to back off and the things are gonna be easier afterwards. Um, example is putting a donut on a baseball bat, swinging that bat, taking the donut off and now the bat feels lighter. Um, and since the same thing should happen in powerlifting is you do a heavier single um, that's not, a maximal attempt, but heavy enough that when you then go to your rep work, that should feel lighter because you already did something heavier. And I, I, I think that very well can work. Um, I've programmed uh, for, for that purpose with trying to see that effect. Um, and I think that can be somewhat there, but I think sometimes it's kind of masked by some other reasons. And I'm gonna kind of get to that now is one, I think a lot of times um, there's less of a potentiating effect and more of a confidence effect. So again, we're going back to why I programmed a single there for someone is to build confidence so that when they get to their rep work, um, that seems easy. I think there is a big mental aspect there than them seeing some very uh, noticeable neurological potentiating effect. Um, and the opposite, sometimes I don't see it work at all because of the first thing I talked about, which was lifter adrenaline is they blow everything on that single. They take that single as like, that is my entire workout. That's all that matters. That's the heaviest weight. Um, I gotta put everything into that. So they do that single, they crush it. And then their top set of like a, a one by three at 380, they then are terrible at because they put everything they had into that single. So we have to, I, I think their post-activation potentiation is very much a real thing. But I think within powerlifting, what we see more so is um, either it works because it adds some type of confidence boost or it doesn't work because a lifter puts way too much uh, uh, credence into that single being the main part of their workout that they need to get amped up for and then they don't take the rest of the workout serious. The third variable is lifter focus. And, and one thing you're gonna see is a lot of these kind of intertwine together. A lot of these, um, it's, some lifters are more susceptible to, some of them, all lifters are susceptible to. Like every one of us has some of this to some extent within our program. So with lifter focus, what I'm talking about there is the ability to uh, put the level of focus into each and every set, which is not easy. Um, that can be affected by a lot of things too. Uh, one of them being outside stress, which we're gonna talk about next as the next variable. Um, but lifter focus is, can we actually put the focus needed on each set? Um, adrenaline is one thing, but focus is another. Focus is, can we maintain form? Can we treat each rep like it's a single, not just going up and down every single rep and, um, and losing form, losing position, not pausing on a bench press or touch and go on a deadlift and, and not trying to keep within the patterns we're meant to do. So um, some things I see there, is uh, going back to some similar things I talked about last, is a single taking away too much from the rest of the workout or even a top set. Um, uh, so again, the baseline would be two by three at 380 and then three by three at 350. Um, the issue I see sometimes with a top set or a top single for some lifters is that they put so much into that's the workout and this is just kind of random fluff, that they really only focus on this. They think about this all day, they think about this as they're warming up, and then they put all of their focus into this set, and then once they get to this, they say, eh, it's lighter, I'm just gonna bust those out real quick. Um, not putting the focus into that, and then all of a sudden, this back off work becomes harder than the rep work, and they tell me, oh, I'm just fatiguing so quick by the fifth set, it was RPE8, um, harder than the top set. While that is plausible and some lifters very well are going to fatigue different than others when it comes to uh, multiple set workouts, it is more likely that somehow they're losing focus slash motivation slash something that is creating some effect to where they're not able to um, basically maintain their focus through all sets. So um, an example of how if someone is very, very obsessive over a single, yet we want to have those in the program, maybe, I mean, in, in most cases, I would say for myself as a coach, 
I usually program a single and then a top set. I don't consider the single a top set. If you watch my other videos, I don't even count it as a set. Um, but if I have a lifter who's overly obsessive over this single being their workout and I have hard time changing that, that mental framework and psychology, what we might do is that this is their top set. They do a single. And then afterwards, they do five sets of three. So we have five total sets. And instead of giving them top sets of 380 and then back offs, we're gonna go in between. So let's say they had a, they had a top set of 380 and then 340, I'll just change that here, was the back off work. We're gonna meet right in the middle. So their average intensity for the entirety of the workout is the exact same as if there was a single and then uh, two by three at 380 and then three by three at 340. You're pretty close to it. Obviously with 340 um, being three sets, it's gonna be more like 355 is the average intensity. But you kind of get my idea of kind of what we're trying to accomplish there is we're trying to kind of find a happy medium where these sets aren't gonna be too hard, but it allows them to kind of in sense make those back offs where we can make this their top set. Um, the other thing is again, a lot of these kind of uh, programming tools have carryover. So we talked about doing buildup sets or pyramiding sets for lifter confidence. That could also be for lifter focus. So um, a lifter constantly thinks the heaviest weight is the main thing they need to focus on. If that's the first set they do and then everything else is backing off and let's say they had four sets of back offs, um, they're gonna put all their focus into this and they're gonna take this less serious. But if instead, and since we do some back offs first, we do one by three at 350, one by three at 365, one by three at 380, they're most likely going to treat these more serious because they know it builds up to this 380. So now we're gonna have more sets having this, this higher level focus because they are proceeding and building the 380. So the lifter perceives these as possibly more important um, slash, even if they don't think it's more important, they're, they're already focusing up to 380, so that focus is usually carrying over from these sets all the way up. Um, the last thing as well is we could do some type of fatigue drop. So um, I'll, I'll kind of show this real quick. So if we had, if we want six total sets, we can go one plus five total sets, and this equals five minus minus this. And let's say they're going to be 380 and 340. If you watch my other videos, you'll be familiar with fatigue stop. It'll be something like at eight RPE, drop to below sets. So what they'll do is they'll do as many sets as they can at 380 unless they hit an eight RPE. And let's say this was programmed at around a seven RPE. So that's gonna be about a 3% fatigue. So this makes them almost kind of have a sense of competition. Like I, I want, if I can, it, while, more isn't always better. It's better if that's gonna help them to take sets more serious and have more focus. So um, it allows them to say, okay, if I can get multiple sets at 380, I can do more sets here as long as it doesn't hit an eight RPE. So there's this, there's this internal focus and drive to continue to do these sets and stay below an eight RPE until their body literally fatigues. So maybe now they get two sets we plug that in and then it says to do three back offs, where if we hadn't have done that and given this some kind of competition or internal drive of to try and have something to shoot for with those sets and do as many as they can, maybe they only got one. And if I gave them a second, they say, oh, that was a nine RPE because they didn't see a point in, in, in increasing their focus for that second set. But if I create some form of competition by doing fatigue drop, they're more likely to take this serious. Now on like a squat or a deadlift, that's a bit harder because we are going to fatigue on those. We're not gonna, we're, most people aren't gonna be able to sustain straight sets as, as least from my, my experience. Bench press, the polar opposite, is a lot of people can maintain straight sets and I find this kind of competition on bench press to be amazing because I, I've had so many people that um, I switched to this kind of format um, that if I gave them one or two top sets, they would be like, oh, that was pretty hard. But once I, I switched them to this fatigue drops, kind of competition building aspect, um, it really allowed them to be able to kind of uh, treat each set like the first set because they want to try to make them just as easy so that they don't have to drop down because to them that's a big win if they don't have to drop down. Um, I try and let them know it's, it's, never, a, it's a, never a fail if they need to drop down because that's what the program's truly trying to do. But no matter what, within their head, in some manner, they see it as success if they can do more top sets. So. Um, Another aspect of lifter focus though to also to think about is some people really struggle with thinking about the day at hand. 
Um, if you give them a five week block and it's week one, they're already caring about week four. Or maybe we're even talking about a lifter who is constantly looking at pass numbers. And on week one, it's lighter than on another block that they did on week one. And they're, they're, they're constantly trying to look at other things and not worrying about the day at hand. Um, an example I'll use here is um, a lifter I have, Joe. Um, he just really struggled with not focusing on the day and focusing on past performance or what was coming in next week, but probably more so past performance. So I really wanted him to stop worrying about what he did in the past or what he's gonna do next week or what he's even gonna do the next session. I just wanted him to worry about what he was going to do on the day. So what I did with him is I started only programming one week at a time. So you'll see here, I just took a, I just took a, I took a copy of his, his current block. Um, he usually runs six week training blocks, but he only has one week filled out. Week two is just a copy of that and I'm gonna adjust it as he goes through. Um, this doesn't allow him to look forward. This only allows him to do as best as he can today. And he knows based off of how he does today, I'm gonna to adjust that the next week. I'm gonna adjust the program. So if that he does really, really well on 285, okay, maybe we're going 295. And so not only does he focus on this day because there's no other weights in the future, they're not programmed yet, even though in my mind, they're kind of already programmed. Um, it also allows him to kind of have a feeling that he controls the program based off of his performance. So what he does in this session then dictates what he gets the next session, which is very true. Like if he does really well this session, I'm probably going to increase the weight more on this following session. If this session's a little rough, I'm probably not gonna bump the weight up very much, if at all. So it, it adds a sense of focus that they really need to care about this individual workout, this individual set, because um, focusing on past performance or future performance doesn't do them any good on the day. Only thing that does them good on the day is doing the best they can. You can only lift a certain amount of weight on any given day. There's no way you can, I mean, when you go into a workout, if you can lift 450 pounds based on everything that day, you're not changing that. You can lift 450 pounds. Um, even if in three weeks you can hit a 470, you can't do that today. So it's not, you don't need to worry about what you're gonna do in three weeks. So this was really kind of the way I, I don't do this with um, a, a lot of people, but people who tend to struggle with focusing on the workout at hand, um, I will only give them one week at a time so that they really have to focus on this workout and feel a sense of responsibility that their performance on this workout then dictates the next workout and that they're gonna get more weight if their workout goes well. The next variable is outside stress. And we're not gonna really look at examples here because outside stress more is a compounding factor on all these other variables. The, the way we perceive outside stress usually compounds abilities lifter to focus, a, a lifter's motivation, a lifter's habits, um, a lifter's confidence. All those things tend to get compounded by the presence of outside stress. Um, and I think outside stress is misconstrued a little bit. The, the typical theory, and I, 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 there's, there's credence to this, and I've used this thought process too, is that fatigue is a bucket and uh, everything we do gets piled into there. So we're, we're, we're pour, like it's, it's a bucket of water and then our recovery is a little hole at the bottom that drains from it. So we, only, we can only recover so fast as we're trying to pour water into it, which is the stress. So we have training stress, we pour our training stress into it. Um, and then we say, okay, we're pouring life stress into it. And it all just kind of boils up and the more stress we have, it all it accumulates in the one stress bucket that we're trying to recover from. And while I think that is true to an extent, I think outside stress is too much, too often portrayed as fatigue and not enough portrayed as a hindrance to focus, motivation, confidence, adrenaline, um, and lifter habits. I think more so, excuse me, those things are affected by this outside stress. So what I mean by that is, let's say you had a terrible day at work. You are stressed out from that, something went wrong with the boss. You're not necessarily tired, you sit at a desk all day. Like you didn't actually induce physical fatigue, it is mental fatigue. You are very stressed from that day. And while there's hormonally stuff is going on, cortisol levels are raising, it, the main thing is that you are going to this workout with a, probably a high likelihood that you don't want to work out. Like you're going to this workout saying, the last thing I wanna do after work is actually work out. And the fact that I've got to hit a heavy single at 405, that's 92%, and then I've got to hit a heavy top set at 380, that's just not the first thing on your bucket list to do. You'd rather go home and sulk and just eat and watch a TV show and, and not worry about lifting today. 
If that's your attitude going in, it's not so much some fatigue aspect that is holding you back when you get to the workout and 405 doesn't move well, it's the fact that that outside stress made you not want to lift that day. And when you don't want to lift, you don't put in the same adrenaline, you don't put in the same focus. Um, a, a subjective RPE view seems uh, a lot different. Um, the fact of the matter is, is when you really want to work out and you really want to push and you want to go hard, um, the ability to take things to a different level is much different. An RPE 7 on your best day ever, if you have like an RPE top set, you may go in on a day you're super motivated and super focused and an RPE 7 is completely different in how you perceive that than a day you go in and you're very, very stressed and you have a lot of external stress or personal life issues and you're not really wanting to go in. Um, we saw that a lot with the coronavirus shutdowns. A lot of people were at home um, and they were struggling with stress from finances and stuff like that. In reality, they're now sleeping more, they're eating more, the recovery is the best that ever has, but this, this outside stress of them probably just not wanting to work out because their daily life is all screwed up, they're, they're stressed about finances, the last thing they're wanting to do is work out. It wasn't that they were weaker, it's just that they couldn't bring the same variables at play when it comes to that focus, motivation, and all those other things because that outside stress was masking it. So um, my biggest point to get across here is just understanding that outside stress isn't always this like physical fatigue that we get. I, I honestly think rarely it's some kind of physical fatigue. It's more so a masking of the other variables that doesn't allow us to go into a workout and then put in the same intensity, focus, drive, motivation that we would if we went in with a clear mind and, 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 and wanting to work out in a high desire to. The next variable is lift or motivation. And again, a lot of these intertwine with each other. So they're, they're I mean, focus, motivation um, are, are, are a lot of intertwined, but they're a little bit different at the same time because there's times you can be motivated, but just not focused. Um, there's times you can be focused, but maybe not motivated. So there, there's, they're, they're, they play into each other, but also they can be separate in kind of what we're wanting to do. So um, with motivation, I kind of already touched on the last, uh, the last topic when it came to uh, outside stress. Um, I think outside stress a lot of times deals with motivation, but also possible performance or perceived performance of what we want within training a lot of times masks our or hurts our motivation. If we're not living up to some certain expectation or standard or seeing the progress we want, we, we have decreased motivation, um, as well as the fact that powerlifting is three lifts. We squat, bench, we deadlift. Sometimes that can get boring and it is is completely normal to have ups and downs in motivation, but it's, it's an understanding of how to be able to regulate that. So, um, I mean, I'm using myself for example. Um, I used to be a extreme adrenaline intensity based lifter. Um, I got super amped up um, and really I didn't have bad training days because one, motivation was always high, but two, even if it wasn't, I got myself amped up. I was always going to be able to, to hit whatever I wanted. Um, I was gonna be able to grind out reps, but nowadays I'm a lot more even keeled. And what I find is that like if I have an RPE top set, um, there legitimately can be a five to percent five to 10% difference on certain days based on my intent and motivation to work out that day. If I go in and I have a high level of motivation to lift and I have a high level of motivation to lift heavy, I very well could go five to three percent more than on the days where I'm kind of just more just going through the process and just kind of uh, just doing the workout to do the workout. So that goes back again that RPE is subjective. Um, it is not always truly what our body can do. It is subjective, but it's a good way to be subjective um, because uh, if we're not going to put forth the same effort, um, we're not gonna grind through and be able to push the same weight. So we need to be able to manage that to make sure we're being able to be um, within the realm of what we can handle. So looking at how we can program with lifter motivation, uh, we've already touched on a couple of the things. I mean, a lot of the same things that, that go with focus or go with um, adrenaline can be the same thing with motivation. Maybe we're not gonna be motivated to do uh, multiple top sets. We have motivation to get kind of one heavy set and then back off. But I'm gonna go more through an example of kind of like myself, someone who works full time, um, maybe at this point isn't like worried about competitive aspects. I don't care about being the best power up in the world. I'm gonna have some ups and downs when it comes to motivation and training and kind of what I wanna exert. So um, RPE training works a lot better for me at this point. Um, someone like myself, a percentage-based program would be uh, 
I, I would say decently detrimental to me because there are some days I'm gonna go in that I'm gonna be able to work at my training max and then there's gonna be some days where I'm going to uh, not be able to be anywhere near that. So um, you might be able to say, like if I had someone who was very, very serious and they wanted to um, be lifting at a very high level, um, they may need something just like confidence. When I say with confidence, if they lack confidence, I'm gonna subject them to singles because we need to force that. If someone wants to be a USAPL national champion and they're having ups and downs in motivation, we've gotta kind of force them to learn that some days, even though you're not motivated, you need to push hard. Um, so maybe for them, we're gonna stick to percentages to force them to understand that they have to be able to um, perform at a certain level if they wanna reach the goals they want. But for someone like me, which is a lot of people, who do this as a hobby, who do this for fun, who do this for health. Um, if they get stronger, that's awesome. But if they have some days where they don't lift as much, that's completely fine. Um, it's better for me to do some type of RPE set um, because that's gonna allow me to regulate based off of what I perceive to be a seven RPE on the day versus um, a true percentage of what a seven RPE is. Because like I said, motivation is gonna greatly dictate what our uh, perceived exertion level is um, and our, our kind of desire to want to grind out hard reps because on a day we are super motivated, if, if I give you an AMRAP, you're probably gonna get way more on that AMRAP than on a day you're not very motivated. So, um, and as I kind of mentioned, um, there's, there's, a, there's a motivational aspect when it comes to even when we're looking at, uh, uh, where's the right, uh, atmosphere, that's what I was kind of going for. So going back to the home gym workouts, um, when you are at your home gym, you're not surrounded by an audience. Um, you're not having spotters. Um, people actually really underestimate kind of one, what spotters do, because then you don't have to think about anything. You just lift your potential. Or two, it, most people aren't trying to show off at the gym, but when there's an audience, they have this different kind of level of what they want to work towards and what they want to push to. Um, and sometimes it's kind of, uh, 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 downplayed of how much kind of being within the gym setting can help when it comes to having that audience of kind of just wanting to be more motivated and keeping yourself accountable. You don't want to fail in front of other people um, and you want to be impressive in front of other people even though if that's not like a, a top thing on your mind, subconsciously you do. Everyone wants to be socially accepted and looked at and revered in some manner. They don't want to look be looked at as failing or, or downplayed of what their status is. So. Um, we see that a lot with home gyms. I have that all the time with my home gym lifters. Um, even before the coronavirus, people just lift in home gyms and go back and forth between regular gyms and home gyms. Is a lot of times they struggle um, with that motivation within their home gym setting. So again, that's where we could use something like an RPE-based training program to adapt to lifter psychology because we know that when they're at the home gym, they're not gonna be able to exert the same amount of effort because the motivation level is just not gonna be there. So um, another example of this though, is I've already kind of touched on this, um, but a different lifter and a different reason why. So Joe, we use more of a weekly program to get him to focus on the day at hand and not worry about other days. Um, for Abby, we use a weekly program because she does really, really, really well with the competition aspect. And I already mentioned the the, the reason of why we would the, the, do a competition aspect within this, with this weekly program is she controls the program. So based on how she does on week one, I will then adjust on week two. So you can actually already see I, I fill it in for her. She got all seven sets of five at 183 pounds and I increased her sets to 187 because she did really well on them. Um, a 3% jump would have been a normal jump, but I actually went, uh, which would have been three pounds, um, but I actually went for four pounds um, for the reason that she had performed really well. So let's give her even a little bit more of a reward. So this was a motivating factor that made each and every day count in some manner um, to create this competition to where um, if she has a down day, she's gonna feel like uh, she's not gonna get the same reward of getting more weight on week two. So this weekly programming aspect um, in a lot of ways, if I have a lifter who struggles with any of these variables, it can be a, a good tool to create kind of um, competition and focus within the, the program to be able to get them to want to perform at a certain level to then be rewarded on the following weeks. The last variable is lifter habits, or I could even call it lifter perception. So um, two examples of what I mean by this, and the two that I kind of primarily am gonna, I, I think about when I talk about lifter habits and perception is fear of injury, or this, this desire to work hard. And I'll kind of explain what I mean that, by that. So fear of injury is probably the more uh, 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 
normal one within powerlifting. A lot of powerlifters have experienced injuries that have set them back, have created a lot of mental distress um, due to um, feeling of, of decreased performance, feeling of not being able to satisfy goals, feeling of inadequacy, feeling of not being able to live up to expectations. Um, injuries can be uh, a, a very fearful uh, aspect of that. So um, one of the things about that is um, a selection of exercise. So um, some lifters have a very, have pin certain exercises to being um, detrimental to their progress or hurting them. And I think in, in, it all depends on the person, but there are some times you need to force them to do that exercise to learn that they, they should not be fearing it, that there's nothing wrong with it. And there's also sometimes we might stay away from it. And it really depends on the significance of the exercise. If they fear barbell squatting, we can't not barbell squat. We need to get them past that fear because that, if they want a power lift, they're gonna have to barbell squat. If they fear a leg press, um, while I'm not saying it, in certain circumstances, maybe we wouldn't try and overcome that fear, but that's not, there's other options. We can belt squat, we can lunge, we, there's, a, there's plenty of other quad dominant um, accessory movements we can do that is not uh, vital to the program. Um, we can work around that if they have some type of cognitive fear, mental fear, some certain exercise that even though it doesn't hurt them every single time they use it, they fear that and then they start getting these these almost kind of like psychosomatic pain signals that they're, they're getting injured because they always relate, when I do leg press, my knee hurts. Um, so um, if it's, I look at that as if it's not uh, required to progress in powerlifting, we can find ways to work around that and easily find different avenues to be able to get the same stimulus. If it is a one of the if it is a is a movement that is vital to powerlifting training, we're going to have to overcome that fear in, in different ways, and that that could be a, a completely different topic and maybe something that's probably someone who's more in the PT realm um, would be able to describe that with kind of like a pain science background. Um, but understanding that we have to overcome those fears and start to disassociate the fact that driving your knees forward on a squat hurts your knees, or deadlifting hurts your back, or or benching hurts your pec. Um, it, it, we need to get away from those fears and, and start to build confidence in those. Um, just like I talked about with confidence and anxiety when it comes to maybe hitting heavy weight, we need to build confidence and reduce anxiety and get overcome these fears when it comes to certain movements as well. Um, the second variable I was kind of talking about there is, um, <clears throat> the second variable I was talking about uh, when it comes to lifter kind of habits and perception is the feeling of hard work. Um, I, I think this kind of comes from either a couple things is one, some people get in the work, when they work out, they want to get a sweat. Like you don't feel like you're working out unless you, you get your butt kicked, AKA CrossFit to a T. Um, it, it even it date back a little bit to more old school ways of lifting is that you take everything to failure um, or even bodybuilding. Body, I mean, I come from a bodybuilding background when I first started lifting and you take things closer to failure a lot more often and you work hard and people start to perceive getting close to failure is working hard and if they're not doing that, it doesn't satisfy some perceptive need of them working hard. Um, and how we can kind of adjust and kind of uh, give into that within coaching is maybe I'm not gonna do that on a squat bench or deadlift because uh, letting them go to failure, letting them max out um, or, or doing something that could be detrimental and high injury risk is not gonna be a smart tool. But with an accessory work, um, we can find ways to do that. Maybe on dumbbell side laterals, we're gonna do an AMRAP set or a drop set to, to give them this feeling of hard work. Um, an actual trick, I, I've, I've personal trained for, for years, uh, the uh, kind of a trick, and this is, goes back to even just general ideas of, of uh, public speaking, people usually remember the beginning and the end the most. Um, so they remember the beginning of the session and the end of the session. So uh, a lot of times to kind of trick a client into thinking they worked hard yet get them to do what I want them to do is we spend the first 45 minutes of the session doing what I want them to do in the sense of what I think is gonna be best for their goals. In the last 15 minutes, do some conditioning work, kick their butt, they leave, just waddling out to the car and sweating like crazy. Like, oh my gosh, that workout was so hard. Well, I only made the last 15 minutes hard. And I made it really hard, really quick, just so that you had this perceived effort that it's hard. So the same thing can happen within powerlifting. If it's a lifter's constantly like, ah, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna go to failure, I wanna work harder. 
give them some dumbbell side laterals with a drop set or myo reps to end their workout because that's the last thing they remember. And if the last thing they remember is it was really hard and I went to failure, I got a crazy pump, that carries over and they get this mindset that they worked hard during that workout. So um, it's just a little simple trick, but it actually works really well. And it, it's a much better time to do that is during accessories is let them achieve that hard work or going to failure or, or doing things that maybe they want to do that wouldn't be a good idea within a, a squat bench or deadlift, but we can we can find ways to work that in with a with an accessory movement just to satisfy this lifter psychology to give them enjoyment in training, not only success in training when it comes to um, um, strength progress, but enjoyment, which very much will lead back to progress because enjoyment and training leads to improving all these variables, it improves motivation, improves focus, improves um, adrenaline, uh, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff improves if we're enjoying training. So finding ways to um, uh, adjust the program to kind of meet halfway with the client if they're wanting to do certain things um, and give them what they want, but be able to do it in a manner that's going to be safe and effective within their training. Some of these things may have seemed pretty obvious, but I think a lot of times they're kind of overlooked in understanding that that's a lot of where the individualization of programming comes from. Um, if I'm looking at the broad spectrum, most people respond to decently similar things. Um, we, we might adjust, I mean, people are gonna probably have differences in, in total workload, but when it comes to this is a training program and we just need to adjust workload based off of that, um, most people respond to the same things. It's the lifter psychology that then changes what they respond to because of how they approach sets on adrenaline, how focused they are, how confident they are. All those things are really, in my opinion, where the majority of individualization comes from and was within coaching, kind of the art of coaching, is understanding how to identify the psychological factors and these variables and manipulate them to best suit the lifter's needs to help them be able to, when they execute the program, do it to the fullest, not just write things on paper because that's what looks good, but write things on paper because you know when they do those, it's gonna play out a certain way due to knowing that on uh, certain days they feel better because on weekends they don't work. On a Monday they work and they're really stressed from the Mondays um, and they're gonna go into their session. That's not the day to plan their heaviest squat and deadlift day. But on Saturdays they get to sleep in a little bit more. They know that they don't have anything prior. They get to have a good breakfast. They go in there, they're gonna have a really good workout because they can take their time. So understanding that there's so many factors that play into how that you're gonna program based off of lifter psychology and lifter lifestyle, um, that probably I overlooked some too and I could keep going with this video, but um, the big thing is understanding that's where a lot of the individualization comes from and how we can start to kind of um, figure out a lifter, what they're gonna respond to and what they're gonna be able to um, manage long-term to best be able to control the variables needed to um, produce adaptations. So, um, if you if you like this video, make sure to like um, and share it. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Um, and if you have any questions below, comment. I'd be happy to answer and give you any feedback and uh, help you need. All right, hope you have a great day. Bye.